original whalers. Uh, interestingly, in the early days, the whalers wasn't just the, the three guys. It was a band. Yes. You know, whalers. Yeah. And, um, but in terms of the primary contributors, uh, that, that's where Peter was. And um, so is that. Uh, a distinguished yeah. career, um, but considering where he started from, Peter came to Kingston in the early 60s, um, coming out of Grange Hill, West Milan, and um, he immediately, he left home, according to the scribes, at the age of, what, 15 years old. Yes. And immediately he came into Kingston. He decided to try and connect with... Um, with the, the great um, Joe Higgs. Yeah. And Joe Higgs, if you remember, was a man who, with um, Wilson, Higgs and Wilson, who created this big tune um, under the auspices of Siaga, Manny O. But right. <coughs> Joe Higgs, basically, coming out of that, established himself as a sort of a coach, a music coach yeah, he, for the youngsters. He, he held music lessons in his, in his home. Or right. the tenement yard that it was. Um, it is also said there's one story that says Peter Tosh actually taught himself uh, guitar and piano by watching this man playing the guitar. But they got expert tutelage from, uh, from Joe Higgs, who sadly passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Right. Um, but he is responsible for a lot of the voice coaching and also a lot of... Uh, artists learning an instrument so that they could better their craft. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because in the, in the modern era, we have all these, these groups, where we call them, the um, scare them crew and the whatever. Essentially, what Joe Higgs was doing would have been a precursor to all of that. Right. Um, by grouping these youngsters in that trench town, general Kingston 12, Kingston 13 era. And pointing them in the direction of music. Like one of the features of the, the, the late 1950s to the mid-1960s period was that given that nothing else was going on for most of these youngsters, everybody basically pointed in the direction of the newest industry that was coming the together, industry. the music industry in Jamaica. Or the entertainment industry. Uh, and, uh, yes, because there were, some of them were dancers, um, we, we remember that there are a couple of these youngsters. That's how they made their name. And some of them at the scene. time, too, were Mike Toasters as the, the MCs. Yes. Um, like well, King's Where we eventually call DJ. DJs. But prior to, you know, it's interesting you talk about King State because before the King State era, you had a slew of other DJs King Cry Cry, Lord Comic, um, and we could have gone on and on and on. Right. But Peter basically came up out of this, this period. Um, the group that... that he assigned um, himself to were the Whalers. Well, but, but the, the, the Whalers but they weren't started the, out as the, the teenagers the initially. Teenagers, yes, which and included then the, Peter Tosh, Bonnie Whaler, Bob Marley. Um, Cherry Green, Cherry Beverly Green, Kelso, right. Junior Brathwaite at some point. Um, but eventually after a, a, the, a stint with Coxon, they basically settled down to the name, the Whaler. The, the, well, whaling, the whalers. whaling Whalers, right? right. And uh, ultimately, they dropped, dropped off the whaling, the whaling and became the Whalers. Now, Peter Tosh, nevertheless, um, came on the scene with, as we said, the, the Whalers, but the biggest tune that launched them at the time would have been the, the big Skatoon, Simmerdown. Give the listeners a little touch out of that, the party. But that was um, that was with uh, with the whalers, the whalers. with <coughs> with um, under Coxon, and we you know we talk about the story behind that in a minute. Simmer down, and that was Simmer down. Song came out in 1964 with the whalers. It's interesting, and people might ask why we you know we feature Peter Tosh, but we start out with the whalers. One of the things that um, the story behind this song, Simmer down, is that. While Marley was there rehearsing with, uh, with Coxon, the, well, the group that was rehearsing with Coxon, they had done, Simadon is a song that they had put together for a little while, but had never recorded it. And um, 
when they went to do the audition at Coxon the, the morning, um, Coxon sit on the studio. I think they, they did three or four songs. And the, the group was a little concerned as to Coxon's reaction. It, it appeared to, to them that Coxon seemed a little disinterested. And so Peter Tosh turned to him and said, turned to Marley and said, me could have simmer down. But Marley wasn't too, too into the song because for him it was a kind of a throwaway song. <laughs> and, and, you know, he was there protesting. But while him carrying on, Tosh started to strum the guitar and started to bring up the rhythm and the rest of the band, the band um, came with him. Right. And the, 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 you know, Somali had no choice, so they basically performed the song. And Coxon, they, Tosh noted that Coxon's demeanor changed when he heard the bars of the song. And he just turned to him and said, all right, all right, all right, all right, stop now. And come back tomorrow. And, and um, you know, take. And, then and they did the, the, the following day, when, the, when they turned up you now at, at, at Studio One, they saw the Scatterlights band. The Scatterlights Band was the biggest band at the time yep. in Jamaica. And this is the band that Coxon brought now to accompany them. And they were figuring that Coxon was only going to do maybe one or two records. They said, all the songs you did yesterday, we want to take. And so they recorded all the songs, including Simadon. And the night, the same night, because Coxon turned it in a wax immediately. You know, and, the, and the same night, they went out, he took them out with him to a, a, a play out session and dropped Simadon on the turntable. And the rest is history. Big, big song. Big, big song. The song spent almost a year in the, in the charts. One of the there's a couple of other seminal songs that, that Tosh was part writer on with, with the Whalers. Right. Songs such as Hoot, Danny, Hoot, The Jerk. They did a cover version of Shame and Scandal in a Family. And um, there was another song called Rasta Shop. Rasta, up. right. That was a, a when, tribute to when, Selassie um, when Selassie, Selassie came. came in. Let's right. give the listeners a touch of, of, of that. Where you start with Hoot Nanny Hoot. Hoot nanny I want to touch a thing here with this Hoot Nanny Hoot because some of these songs, as you say, um, Hoot Nanny Hoot was a, was a, a, was a colloquial like a term yeah. that used in, in folk music in America. Okay, um, that's what I was it, thinking about. I think what they claim it referred to things grass. that you yeah. couldn't really particularly identify. You know it exists, but thing. And so but it was a it was a, 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 a country music, if you will. Right. And Tosh basically the song is a popular little song in America and Tosh grabbed onto it and, and and did his own rendition of it. Which again shows how much we had our finger on the pulse of American there music. You go. Because it wasn't like Hootenanny Hoot, like a bluegrass. It was a bluegrass. Like a precursor type, yeah. to country it, as I said, expression. Uh, yeah. in, in America, it uh, classified it basically as country music, if you will. Right. But, um, and then Shame and Scandal was a big hit in Trinidad by this Calypsonian, Sir Lancelot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting because the 1960s, what you were seeing is... Uh, we did a lot of mental music in the 19, late 40s, 50s, and it traversed all the way down to the 1960s. So coexisting with, with our blues and R&B and, right. and so on. But in the, also in, the, in 1962, when Jamaica became independent, a lot of Calypsonians came, up, came into Jamaica. And, um, I think they had a big concert where all these other musicians from outside of the region came to sort of make their contribution to Jamaican celebration of, of its independence. And, and um, of course, their entries are Calypso and entry. I think people like Lord Creator, yes. who never, who basically didn't go back. Um, Lynn Tate uh, was right. one of those musicians who came. Yeah. And the, the, the arrangements he had with the the promoters who brought him would up here that redefined, broke down. Would have right. redefined Jamaican music. Well, no, no, he, he didn't go back, not because he could, he just never had any money. And <laughs> so, because the promoter basically disappeared on him and so thing. But the point I'm making is, 
the calypso and influence in the music in that early 1960s period was significant. Yeah, and then also the idea of being a British Commonwealth was much more... It meant more. Yeah, it meant more then. You could, you could have the right to move about and work without a visa as long as you could show that you're a British citizen. Right. right. But remember, Jamaica was kind of to be, uh, attempting to step away from that because we were among the first, well, the first in the, the English-speaking Caribbean. Right. To walk away from and in thing. August of the same, later on in August of the same year, Trinidad. But Trinidad not only did they break away, Trinidad but they give, rewrote give the their whole the constitution. Um, constitution and became a republic. Yeah, but so, um, the, but to to go back to the thing here, um, so Tosh was to your point, God had his finger on the pulse significantly, and he was taking really drinking in the experience with these out of town, out of Jamaica musicians. And I think it's a credit to the music that somebody like Tosh would decide to do his own rendition of Shame and Scandal in the Family. Right. Um, there are another little R&B piece too called Making Love. Yeah. Um, um. And then they did a duet as well with, with um, Rita Marley. Rita Marley. Um, oh, at the time it was Rita, um, Rita, Rita Anderson. Anderson. It, it, it's Alpharetta Anderson, right? <laughs> Her Cuban name. Yes. Um, and, and for those who don't know, Rita was actually born in Cuba. But grew up um, in Jamaica. But grew up in Jamaica. And then he did and the, the tune, Rasta Shook Them Up. Again, all of these songs were coming out, 1963, 64. Yeah, there was another if one remember, similar to that called Selassie Serenade. Selassie Serenade. Um, the thing with Peter Tosti is that he was a pretty good guitar player. And he did a lot of solo work he on had ear, some man. of the Whalers early music um, thing. But we'd love to give a, a, a listen to some of the, the, this music. We have an eternity. We have um, uh, Selassie Serenade. All right, let's go. In the 1960s, this was the era of, Trios. if you look at North American groups, it was, um, you know, quartets, and trios, trios um, you had quintets, so the, you know, the Temptations, etc. So it was, it, it was that an era of singing groups, and essentially right. the Whalers started out as that, a singing group, and then ultimately phased into a band. The thing, too, is that all three were pretty good vocalists. My, my, my top choice of the three would have been Peter Tosh. Um, Marley, they, all three could write. I think Marley was um, a lot more of the creative vein. But Peter Tosh had his finger on the pulse of what was going on. In fact, he was the rebel in, in, the, in the group. Um, as Chris Blackwell said in an interview, you know, sometime, um, some time ago, that while the three of them worked together and worked together well, they what they had was a healthy respect for each other's talent. Um, Bonnie would have been the, the the glue, so to speak, the the, the older of the oldest of the three, um, and then. You have Peter Tosh, who is a, a huge, you know, his personality was not something you could have put up on a piece of paper, <laughs> you know. And, and, and the he, man was just he, a rebel. Man. He, he was, was a, and his per, he, he reflected it. In fact, um, Carlton Barrett, in, in his, in the, there's a book I was reading some time ago, Barrett talked about, the, you know, the first time he saw Peter Tosh, he always had a guitar, even from as early as them time. And he said, Peter is a man who him just go about in business, him not into anything. Him, it was all about his music. And so him come in the studio, him, you know, very, very serious about it. And I always have him proverbial spliff from as early as those times. But um, to the song itself, I am the toughest. The song was more synonymous with to... With the rude boy era. With the rude boy era. And so uh, it was... A sort of him making a statement in terms of this rude boy thing um, that anything you can do 
you know, call right. me in because not only can I do it, I can do it better. In other words, I'm not afraid to take on any challenge. And as I'm saying in the song, I'm the toughest. And you needed to be tough in those times to be able to survive in that, you know, because yeah, by then... that it, time, it yeah, was producer, the, niam artist. Dog eat dog <laughs> thing. And producer, as you're right, eat the artist <laughs> for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And um, Tosh was not afraid to challenge the, the, the status quo. And, and also there was an incident as to of uh, Peter Tosh's um, recording being shipped abroad and they changed his name from Peter Tosh to, to Peter, Peter Touch. Touch. Yeah. And you know there's a lot of Jamaicans who say Peter Touch just from a mispronunciation. So a big part of it is the mispronunciation, true. I, but it also, I think to... I'm kind of of the view, based on, you know, just retrospectively, that some of that was kind of deliberate. Um, the, the, the thing is, though, that Tosh, a lot of music, in, in particular, a lot of this is instrumentation music, was released on that same Peter Touch label, if you will. Right. Um, um, the same Selassie Cernier that you played. Yeah, those Return were of the Will and Soul record right. label. That the Wheelers had after they left um, uh, well, Carson. When, when, well, th that's an excellent point too because Marley had walked away um, from the, the music after a while and went to the States. And as you pointed out earlier, off camera, that you know it was Tosh who carried the group. Junior, Brathwaite, um, I think Cherry and, right. and Kelso left the group at the time because according to them the money was in the thing. They brought in this guy, Dream Walker, Constance Walker. Right. Call him Dream. Never really made much of an impact. But I, I know we're kinda going backwards and forwards, but you know, they it's as we well, yeah, we have to lay the foundation yeah. for Peter Touch. Because right. as as we had discussed earlier, um, at the off camera we were saying that Tosh's contribution before I mean his personal contribution to the whalers and also the preamble to his solo career is largely overlooked. And it's almost as if Tosh's career started with Magadog. Absolutely. But you know, and, and, it, and it, nothing is further existed before from the then. truth. Yeah. But as you mentioned, Magadog, that pushed you, no, 1971, when right. Tosh now decides that, hey. Um, and, and, and this was one of the things that, that really distinguished him. He knew his value, right? He knew his worth. He knew that he had a lot of music in him. And while he was not unprepared to continue with the Whalers, he wasn't going to do that at the expense of developing his own solo career. And so in 1971, um, he made that decision, a deliberate decision to, to push through with this. Solo now, the Mafigeta Beaten God was another song that did very well on the local charts, um, the Jamaican local charts. And it also um, provided a, a good exposure for what Joe Gibbs had going on at his, what would have been then a, a fairly new studio. Right. Um, the organ, you hear that featuring heavily in the music around this time. And because also now the horns. And, and, and horns. The horns would eventually fade out because the organ was kind of a, it was changing the music. And, and, you know, so here you have Peter Tosh at this edge of the change with two seminal songs. He went on and added a few more. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, in fact, the arrangements with, um, with, with him and Joel Gibb, Joe Gibbs made a considerable difference in terms of not only Peter Tosh's catalogue, but also the value that Joe, Joe Gibbs would have brought to the Jamaican recording business. Now, Tosh went on to do a couple other numbers, as I said earlier. Um, uh, Arise Black Man, right. Black Dignity, and then he did a song that was kind of influenced by um, Prince Buster, the, the song called um, Here Comes the Judge, which was... His Prince Buster had done a few years earlier, Judge 400 Years and Judge Dread and so on. Yes, and, and uh, Peter, a whole heap of Judge, Judge, right, Judge, Judge. Peter basically revisited 
this. Um, that song, too, he took, they, they, I think they built the song around the, one of the baddest rhythm that came out of Jamaica at the time, the Abyssinians rhythm, Satamasa Ghana. Right, so and here um, comes the judge. Let's just give a listen yeah. to Here Comes the Judge. Because it said here. The business and mind your own. Listen, <laughs> you remember we talked about this earlier, um, well, some time ago, God, that one of the things about our Jamaican music is, you know, and, and, and I think Tosh is demonstrating that in terms of the ownership of the music, where you are now taking your everyday experiences and putting it to song. Yes. Um, we hear use the term Mary Long Tongue. Right? Um, you know, if Doc was on the show, he would yeah, tell you about the anthropological throwback the, the, the to the connotations our, yes, to that. To, to, Absolutely. To our Af African folklore of the village gossip. And, and that's what Mary Long Tongue <laughs> is. Mary Long Tongue, she yes. come, she just want to pass and see like a shadow over her yard. And before you know it, the whole district, the whole know. district know and, and then she embellish and all of that. But Tosh is saying, is speaking to the ethos of what makes us all Jamaican and nobody's business. I don't think there's another tune that can capture that no. um, as much as Tasha had, had done. Over there, there was a, there's a bit of a break between 1971 and 1976 when he came out with the Legalize It album, which called for, you know, because remember there was a peace concert. You have to talk about Tasha's <laughs> behavior at a peace concert, you know. Yeah, but we don't want to read. We, 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 if you, you, you listen, there is a whole side of Tosh that we think here, and that's why I don't want we we jump want to jump in. We want to condense it in two hours, Rich. Yes, remember, we're not whole well, afternoon. Remember, you know, we are up getting some trouble with some of them two. They're going to understand road, it, but, but let's no, but listen, I, I think we the, the public is aware of a lot of the particularly when Tosh went to Colombia and, and so on, where the music was now getting a different kind of airplay. But his local catalog, and, and, and especially in this area, music like Once Bitten, Once right. Bitten yes. and Twice Shy, Ketchy Shubi. Ketchy Shubi is one of the wickedest tunes, Dark a, Teeth. So for me, Ketchy Shubi is a metaphor for a relationship between a man and a woman. Absolutely. Just like Bob Marley's story. Come make we go play some catchy show with. Yes. But it's a cricketing <laughs> connotation to those who are uninitiated. Yes. Thing. And then, uh, remember too, because he spent a lot, a lot of Tosh's thing was developed around his relationship with Joe Gibbs. And remember, after he and Joe Gibbs, because he did a clutch of tunes with Joe Gibbs, and then Joe Gibbs, as the usual thing, them not pay him. So... He, he, in fact, he did, he did a, an off-take of De Desmond Decker's Rude Boy Train when, um, and, and, and Desmond Decker's Shantytown. And, and the, the toughest was sort of a, yes. a, a, a take on that Rude, Rude Boy era. Which we played earlier. We, right, we played that earlier. And then he revisited again in the 1980s right. and did a re remix version of that song. Now, when he did Magadag, and I want to go back to that, because Magadag was what caused him to follow to Joe Gibbs, because the song sold well, but he don't make any money. And so he decided to part company with Joe Gibbs. But on the parting shot that he left Joe Gibbs with was a big tune, a biting tune called Once Bitten. Let's give shy. a listen to it. Let's give a listen. Bitten. Yeah. Now this bad, song, bad, 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 song bad, bad, but <laughs> it, it, this was now um, Tosh. He had walked away from his relationship with with um, Joe, Joe Gibbs. Gibbs, and this around this time he was well. After leaving Gibbs, he distributed a, a lot of this, the work he was putting out at this time on Bob Marley's Tough Gang label. So in as much as he was looking to establish himself as a, as a, a solo artist, he still kept some of the business within right. the group. Right. And, and so the Tough Gang label um, took the, the responsibility for getting the music out there. And then he formed his own label called Intel Diplo, which was... Intelligent, Intelligent diplomat, diplomat. Um, for his Imperial Majesty Il Selassie. Essentially, uh, 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 that, that's himself it. An ambassador. Right. 
<laughs> and um, that Ketchy Shubi, Dog Teeth, which was one of the songs, and Ketchy Shubi were two of the early releases that came out on that Intel Diplo um, just before we got to the end of 1971. 1972 now, the Whalers is now the gathering some momentum as a group. And it sort of slowed him down a little bit. He, that notwithstanding, they were still putting out music. Um, he put out 1972, again, so that was the election year. Um, no Mercy, You Can't Blame the Youth, Mark of the Beast, Foundation, and the Monster, What You Gonna Do. So let's give the listeners a taste. Can't Blame the Youth. And again, if it is Sunday, it you're is in Sunday tune scoops. with Sunday Scoops. And um, you, apart from listening to us or watching us on Facebook, you can watch us live. Now, this song got um, brand new second hand. This would have been Peter Tosh's first single after he left the Whalers. And this you was know, in 1976. 1976, right. 75, uh, 76. The thing, though, is he and Marley had a falling out. Bonnie Whaler had declared from early, 1972, um, that his days are tour, 1973, rather. I think they right. were in England. Mm -hmm. And um, this was when they did that tour with Johnny Nash. And the tour never worked. And Bonnie Wheeler decided to listen. Me and I tour, I'm going to go on a more iron bird with, <laughs> with, with, with you know. So any overseas touring business, I'm out of it. And, and back in the day, you know, one of the catchphrases and say, yo, that a step. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Bonnie Wheeler basically decided and, and stepped. And so um, Tosh continued, but around November, I'm told, there was a a clash between himself and Bob, and a little argy bargy go on and thing. But Tosh basically used that as the cutoff point, and he, he left the group. And right? we say him write this song. Yes. And then he posted this song. Although you hear it um, talking about talking a about it look like it's a woman thing, but Tosh is a man who know for true word, you know. And this is really what you call the quintessential throwword song. Because according to the scribes, it really was throwing words of uh, what would have been left of, of the whalers. Because in his mind, while, you know, and, and Blackwell made the same argument that they, res they, they respected each other, although they never trusted each other. But Peter Tosh was a man who called Blackwell. White Chris worse. White, 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 we call it white, white worse. worse, right. And so, but this was kind of a, a true word, if you will. Yeah, the part at, of the song that I like, Richie, was to say, look for your heel back, look how it's tough. And your jaw won't feel like Spanish, Spanish tongue and cough. <laughs> but that was just him, um, you know, throwing on the gauntlet. And then he now decided that, hey, Around the same, just around the same time, <coughs> he followed up. Okay, he followed up the brand new second hand with a song that defined Peter Tosh thereafter. A song called "Legalize It." We call it the Ganja. Be careful, no, 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 will kill you. Now listen, this song, um, "Burial," and, and legalize, "Legalize It." In fact, wh when these songs came out, 1975, um, Peter Tosh had no. Uh, signed on with Columbia Records and the, the first album, this would have been his solo album um, titled Legalize It. Of course, you, you imagine an album with two songs that is as big as that and then on top of that you throw down Ketchy Shubi. The song, the, the album when it hit the record shops everywhere was a monster. <laughs> Every single where. And then Tosh, uh, by this time now, he had em engaged the services of Sly and Robbie. You know who Tosh reminded me of? Hi there. If you enjoyed that clip, go on over to our website at yardmedia.com where you can watch the entire broadcast at your leisure. And while you're there, why don't you check out our other reggae music features? And before you leave, 
pick up some of our Jamaican reggae merchandise and hey, don't forget to tell your friends.